Yeah. Well, we have we have nothing but time. Oh, that's true. Yeah. That's true. No, I'm gonna send. This Half to my you. class has a question about this. So. <laughs> that's true. Actually, he so you time. have well, it's a full it's unanimous. You can't get people to unanimously agree on anything. Yes, that's a hundred. You know, it's like if you had a room full of people that ask, "Is it snowing outside?" You'd get an argument from someone. <laughs> so, if a hundred percent of my class has a question about something, that's a big deal. So we'll start out with that. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna send this to you. Okay. And if you could just verify that you have the ability to open Will do. But I will spend a minute talking about this, though, uh, both in Android Studio and in uh, Eclipse. The question that we're going to address is, like, where are your files, what you would need to send me to have it graded? And before we, th that's fine, you're welcome to do that. You are also welcome to just call me over like during lab and have me look at them and grade them if that's more convenient. Uh, on occasion I have had goofy situations where you know there was just for whatever reason the versions people were running and rather than me pulling my hair out trying to figure out sometimes it's better just to do that. So that's always an option as well. But let's go and let's look at Okay. You can always, and, and let's, let me tell you what to do if you run into that. If you run into that, email it to my regular email address, mzellers at lorraineccc.edu, but also post a message to the Dropbox saying, I emailed it to you. All right, the Dropbox is what I go on as far as what um, needs to be graded. If it's not in the Dropbox, I don't know about it. So it's mzellers? mzellers at... C -E -L -L -E -R -S, right? That's correct. At lorraineccc.edu. No mail.lorraineccc.edu? No. Probably ends up in the same place regardless, but yeah, just lorraineccc.edu will work. So the question was, is like, where do our files go? And they typically go, well, depends how you open it, depends on a lot of things. Let's go in and create a new project in um, Eclipse. So I'll go file. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't want to do that. Pardon me? Where everything would wind up, yeah. And the workspace files. It's like user account. Right. Right. Well, we had a question about that. So that's why I'm going over it. So I'll click. I, I want to create a new Android application project. I can answer some questions here. I'm not going to put anything in here, so I'll just call it test or something like that. And I'll click next. And if you notice, it's a little harder to see if it's disabled or if it's checked. So I'll uncheck it. It says where it is going to create it. Create project in my current workspace. And right now my current workspace is users, Paul Norod, documents, workspace, slash test. So workspace, that's my, that's where the files in this workspace lives and this will be called test. So I go. You can put it wherever you want. Yeah. Yeah. You can just by changing that. A, a lot of things I said, it, it said it was like ideal to put them in there because then your, your IDE always knows where to look right. at projects at. Exactly. All right. So now let's go out in the Finder and find this guy. forget what the oh Android workspace here we go or not it was a folder called workspace so I will look for that This 
this is Eclipse. Oh, right here, Documents Workspace. There we go. And it even says up here where your workspace is. So, Documents. So that's created 525. If we look inside of this, we'll see all the stuff necessary. So you just grab this, zip it, and you're good to go. All right. And you could send that in. That empty file is 14.1 megabytes, <laughs> even though I did not do a single thing in it. All right, let's do with Android Studio. Yeah. Let's do the same thing. It's the same. I mean, if you can't translate that, if you can't translate the instructions I'm given on a Mac to a Windows thing, then you got bigger problems than, than that. Yeah, all operating systems kind of start to lose after a point. All right. So let's drag this over. I'll create a new project. And again, project location. Um, we can put it wherever we want. In this case, I'm thinking this is the last place I use. I was grading a student's work, so I could go and change that to wherever I want. Please choose a location. I could put it in documents or whatever. And in either case, we will get our project. And again, it says up here where it's located in Documents My Application. So. I go into documents, you'll see it will be my application folder there. And that contains all the stuff underneath that. And again, you can zip it up and send it. Again, the other, the other thing in this class, and in a way it's preferable for me, is to um, just at the end of class pull me over and take a few minutes. What's good about that is I can give you instant feedback. You know, it's always hard to give feedback via email. You know, I may assume that you understand something that you don't, or I, you know, I may put something away that I think is clear, but then you have questions about it, and, and it, it's very conducive to good learning if I can just like, be with you while I'm looking at it and point and tell you um, what's going on and all that. We did, we have missed essentially two classes this time, so if you need extra time on any of the homework assignments, you're welcome to take it. What I want to do today is I can't 100% recall where we were on the, um, on the uh, uh, Deedle tip calculator, so we'll finish that up. And then we'll look at the Deedle favorite Twitter search application. If I remember last time,
we were focusing on two things, really. We were focusing how our activity can, how, the, how let, let me phrase it this way, how our activity and our GUI are sort of glued together. It, that, that would be a good way, I would think, to summarize what we've been focusing on. So we've been focusing on that from two perspectives. From one perspective, we focused on All right. handle the user events so that when the user clicks a button, something happens. All right. And we can go in and write code is how to point to the different elements of the GUI so that we can pull values into a calculation or whatever from the text box. So that's really been our focus. All right? We want to make sure we have that down so that we can understand how to glue our code so that when the user does something, our code does something, and then how to point to different things on the page. That's sort of been our emphasis over the past few classes. So let me look at and let me pull up the Deedles tip calculator. And if memory serves, there was nothing terribly exciting about anything except our custom class. And so I'll copy that into text edit. And so we can take a closer look at it. I actually was, I actually wish, well, no, I don't. I'm not going to lie. I, say, I actually wish we had class one day, but I'm thrilled that we had a snow day on one day. <laughs> all right. But one thing I did want to talk about class is I know there was a question about um, the statement was made, if my understanding was made, that they've the examples, and I think I finally figured out that the question, or one of the questions, was that notice this one doesn't say it implements the listener. That's fine. You don't have to have your activity as the one that implements the listener. Something has to implement the listener. It doesn't necessarily have to be the activity. And we're going to see, um, I guess all told, three possibilities. All right, and in this one we see, the, in the earlier one we saw, in my tip calculator we saw the first possibility. That is the activity itself implemented the on-click listener. And remember, any class can do that provided it, implement, uh, it, it uh, implements an interface. If it implements an interface, it promises it has the functions to handle the job for an on-click listener or for whatever. In this case, notice we don't have anything about this guy implementing the listener. So this isn't going to serve the role as the on-click listener or the, the slide listener or the text change listener or whatever. What does serve the role for that? We have some classes down here. And we have a class here, and that might be the two. And these are called inner classes. All right. And because they're called inner classes because the definition of the class occurs inside our main class, inside our main activity. So, we create it this way. We create our on uh, seek bar change listener. And that equals a new on seek bar change listener. In order for that to work, we need these methods on progress changed, on start tracking, on stop tracking, on, I guess that's all, those, those three. 
Notice we don't have to put any code in there. All right. We simply, we do, however, have to acknowledge those methods. Um, and if we're not going to do anything, we don't do anything, but we're not allowed to omit them. If we omit them, that's a sign to the compiler that we're not living up to our promise of being able to serve that job. All right. So we still have to put those in here. This actually is a, a case, too, of an anonymous class, because we're not really creating a class here. We're creating an object of type um, on seekbar listener. So what we have here is, on progress changed, we call, we set the current percentage from the seek bar, get progress. That will give you a value between 1 and 100, or 0 and 100, rather. Then we call update custom. Okay? If you remember this application, I installed it earlier today. If you remember this application, We have a text box to put the bill total in, and it computes the tip and the total at three predefined levels, 10%, 15%, and 20%. And it also gives us a custom level that initially is 18%, and we can slide it. So as we type in the amount of the bill, it calculates the tip at these three levels, calculates the total at these three levels, and we have a custom slider. And we show the percentage, and it calculates the tip and the total amount. You can pass that around if you want, if you have not already seen it. So, in our code, <laughs> Big spender. Stops at 100%, that's it? What if, what if you really got great service? I was drunk, so I gave a big tip. Notice that if we change the seek bar, we call update custom. We call the method that updates this stuff down here. We don't have to update the table, right? Because those rates are predefined into the three slots. Notice that we don't actually have the code in the listener to do the update. We call a method to do the update. All right? We call a method to do the update. That's important. All right? That's important. We want to keep our listeners fairly thin. We don't want a lot of processing logic there. Um, because we want to be able to have the ability to call this method in a couple different places. For example, with the slider or seek bar. If I move the seek bar, I update the custom amounts. I also up the custom amounts, update the custom amounts if I change the bill total. So I change it from 55 to 60. Well, it updated that too, and it updated that. So I don't want the code living in this listener. I want to call update the custom area. 
Now, because this is declared as part of our main activity class, we have access to that seek bar variable, which we initialize, and we have access to the update customer method. So if we scroll up here, when it's created, when the application is created, we do a lot of things. One of the things that we do is we get a pointer to that seek bar. How do we get a pointer to it? The same way we've been getting pointers uh, to that, through our workhorse method, find view by ID. All right, That takes an ID and finds the thing in the content view that has that ID. And again, we cast it as a seek bar because we want to treat this as a seek bar. Right? There's some certain things about a seek bar that we want to do. Namely, we want to associate a seek bar listener with that. You can't associate a seek bar listener with just any old view. You have to do that with a seek bar. All right. So our code that actually updates the custom simply grabs a few things, does a calculation, sort of converts the amount into a percentage by multiplying it by 0.01 and it formats and outputs the string. So really nothing earth shattering. I would suspect that that code is pretty straightforward to follow through. So I won't really go over it. <laughs> what I'm more interested in is sort of the Android-y parts of this. In other words, how do you point to things on the screen? How do you um, add a listener to it and so on? And also just good general programming practices, i.e. keep your listeners thin. All right? And that's, a good, that's good advice regardless of the context you're in. All right? Now, we have a, another listener, a text watcher, that we associate with that edit text field somewhere up here in the... on create event. Here we go. We grab a pointer to that bill edit text and we add a add text change listener to that. And what does that do? You can almost imagine what that does. All right. First thing it does is it grabs the value from the text box, all right, and converts it to a string. Looks for an exception. If there's not an exception, what does it do? Well, it calls two methods. I still need to update the custom area because I've changed the amount of the bill, so whatever the custom percentage is. But I also have to update the standard as well. Now, the update standard does pretty much the same thing the update custom does, except it's based on those hard-coded percents of 10%, 15%, 20%. I have a question. <laughs> What is S? What is S? S is a variable. S is a variable of some sort. All right. A numerical value. A numerical value. Where does S come from? It it yeah. It is the value. It is. It is a character, S is a character sequence that is in our edit text field. Now, I thought we called that edit text field bill text or something like that. And we did, bill edit text, and we did. However, if we look at this here, when the on text change method fires off, it gets called with certain arguments that explain a little bit more about the event that just happened. 
that variable s gets passed to this, all right, and it indicates the current value of the character sequence that is in the text edit, uh, the edit text field. So I can use that. I first have to convert it to a string, all right. I parse it as a double. We really should never have an exception, right, because we've defined this as a numeric field, and we only have the numeric, so I wouldn't think we would have an exception here unless I can. That's what I'm looking to see. Yeah, it's not even allowing me to put in multiple decimal points. Wow. All right. But, yeah, if, if these classes are, the aim of these classes are to be airtight. So this is a string. So we have to treat it as a string. So we can go and parse it to a double. That's fine. And we can be pretty confident that that's going to work. But, like I jokingly said, I think in the earlier class, this is kind of like um, wearing a belt and suspenders, right? We make sure the input only allows for certain things, but we trap for the exception. Is everyone in here familiar with how exceptions work? Can I have a show of hands of people that are familiar? Okay, so I won't really go over that then. But again, the idea is, and, and I run into this problem every so often with students, students sometimes when they create classes, create classes for their specific issue, not realizing that it could be used in other contexts. So therefore we want to make it as a component and reusable. So again, this gets passed. And again, we have some methods here that we don't do anything with because we're only interested in the on-text changed method. Yes? When, when I have a question as far as like passing in parameters to methods and stuff uh -huh. like that. Um, originally, when I had set up my uh, uh, rock, paper, scissors application, I had just, as an argument, I used the method calls. And it worked fine. I thought it was erroring out, but it was erroring because of a different issue. Okay. It, worked, it just wasn't declaring an actual winner. Right. Is it better to set, would it have been better, like if I was to pass in a string for would it be better to set that method to a string than it is to pass in a method as an argument? Or is there uh, really an, no difference? In other words, in other words. Like if I was to do a call to a method right Yeah. Now, okay. Is it better to say s equals object.method? call another method s or is it better to say call another method and put in there your other method call I think that's what you're asking yeah yeah it seemed to work. it worked either way mm -hmm. I just didn't know if like tossing in methods in that yes, was no. a that's not conventional. You tell me that's conventional to do that? That people, programmers, go methods inside methods like that? Yeah, passing in is an argument, as a parameter to another. Is that a fact? Okay, first of all, I haven't said anything yet. I, I was just making sure I understood his question. Yes, yes, yes. That's bizarre, because what ends up happening, depending on a class you are, you can have unintended consequences. I, I've never seen that. Okay. So you, I like to know if that's. First of all, First of all, to answer the question, is it kosher, is it legit? Yes, it is. You can do that. As long as, for example, as long as this method returns the kind of, the type of um, return value that this guy's argument is expecting, that's completely fine. Do people do it? Yes, they do it all the time. Is it better to do it this way or that way? My issue is with readability. That if you go a little too crazy with this, it's going to be hard to, be hard to read. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, folk, folks do that. Yeah, that's, what, that's how I've always done it. I just didn't know if, like, if, there was a, if it was better to set it to a variable and then pass it in, or if it really... Because I've done that a lot of times. It's clearer that way, because the, the situation is, if I'm looking at that code, mm -hmm. I don't know what that's returned. I have to figure out, call another method, what is, what is it expecting? Now, the top part... I know if S is a string, I can clearly see, okay, object 
dot method is returning a string that goes into the next method, it's easier to read that. So when you were saying what you're saying and he put that at the bottom, I said I'd never seen that. Yeah. Yeah. So it, I just want to clarify if there's any standards. On yeah. That. It, uh, and again, I I don't care one way or another. Either one of them is legit. I mean, and I would not argue that one of them is better. From a technical perspective, my issue would be, a, would be similar to what you said, a readability issue. Which code is easier to understand? All right? You're not really saving any time from doing it one way or the other. Not any time of any significance anyhow. I typically do it this way because, again, if I do that, that gets real cluttered. That can get real cluttered quickly. And doing it the first way gives you... Doing the it the first way... Yeah, if you need to do that, that's for sure. All right, but uh, again, either one of them is is a legit way to do it. Okay. Um, again, my thing would be how well you understand it. If you understood that, then yeah, go for it if you want to. Um, I tend to use I tend to do this simply because you know it's it's easier to think of like really breaking it down. For okay, first I'm going to grab this value, then I'm going to call this function, then as opposed to doing that. Yeah, exactly. And you know the funny thing is, is um, even back when there was a difference, um, in the, I guess we can say late 20th century, it wasn't, it wasn't the mid 20th century, but when I was in college back then, when, when that, that was an issue, all right, I remember like the professor in the capstone course said, you know, more stupid things have been done in the name of efficiency than almost anything else. You know, just trying to trim off those, like trying to get a little too clever for your own good. Yeah. Um, almost like, and again, I've seen great debates about this online, almost like the Seahawks throwing on that play in the Super Bowl. You know, it's almost like they try, they outthought themselves. You know, it's like sometimes the obvious answer is the obvious answer for a reason, right? But anyhow, uh, it is funny. I've seen statistical analysis that say that that actually was not a bad play call. But you know, obviously it's a obviously it's a bad play call because it didn't work. But you know, prior to that, you don't know it's not going to work. All right. At any rate, that's a good question. Again, that that's a style issue. Um, in my mind, you know, uh, in, in programming, you know, there are. There are some key things that we could point to code and say this code is better than that code. All right, but there is times that I can point to code and say, well, you know, that code or that code, your choice, whatever you see. And and I would think that that's an example of that. Any questions about this guy? All right. The one thing we did not talk about here that we will talk about. Um, just to mention it here, is the saved instance state. This allows us to remember the values that were in there if the application goes dormant and is brought back. So, for, yeah, where where is that? There's update standard. Here is the on create. Here's if we're restoring the application. All right. So if we're just brand new restoring or creating the application, it's going to default the build total to zero and the percentage to 18. If it's being restored from memory, in other words, if it's running but like dormant, then it um, you bring it from the shared preferences. Where do we put it in the shared? Yeah, where, would, where is that? Unsaved. Unsaved instance state, yeah. We go and we save the, uh, we save the uh, preferences um, so that we can come back on it. That's one thing that, that's tough even for Android phone owners, forget about programmers, all right, is like when you back out of an application, it, 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 a lot of times it's still running. Right? So you can go look, if you look at the applications that are running, there'll be like 65 of them. 
like Pac-Man. I ain't played Pac-Man today. Well, you played it a while ago and you didn't terminate it, yeah. you know, and uh, that that can cause grief. Is it, is it the same as like serialization, or is this different? Than what... It it's a similar topic. It's a it's a it's a similar concept, but it's a different thing. Yeah. Um, it's similar in that we're saving the state of something so we can bring it back later. Do, does the on start and stuff like that methods, do those exist in uh, just normal Java applications? Or is no. This is, this is specific to the activity. Okay. The activity class. All right. Let's look at the favorite Twitter search application. Oh, boy. I don't know. It's funny, if we were like ranking social media apps, Twitter would be like at the bottom of my list. I, I just can't get into it. I, it's one of the most useless things. I don't know, some people love it. I've never used it. If I had friends, maybe that would be different, where I was like letting everyone know just quickly what I'm doing. So maybe that's from on my perspective. Yeah, I, have, I have a Twitter account that's uh -huh. kind of semi-dormant. Yeah, I'm kind of in the same. Right, right. And, uh, yeah, the only thing I subscribe to is, let me see, Borg, Squirrel, and all the other, like, bot spams. Okay, right, right, right. As, as a joke. Uh, awesome. Yeah, I, I also have one that's dormant, and I can't even tell you what I subscribe to. Other than the fact that I think someone at one point hacked it and uh, had me following a bunch of bots, and I cleaned those up, and I should be okay now. Favorite social media, I would say, is Instagram. Instagram is cool. Pardon me? Instagram is like online cancer. <laughs> well, I, I would see it as more benign than that, but yeah, I, I like Instagram. All right, at any rate, favorite Twitter searches. And let me run the app first. I think I did install it here. We'll talk about it. I always like for you to have an idea of like what this is actually doing. And then we can go in and look at the code. This allows you to query Twitter. All right. So you can put in something to search Twitter for. So we can put in Cleveland Browns. Because it seems there's a lot going on with the Cleveland Browns lately. And, and none of it particularly good. So I put my search term in as Cleveland Browns. I then create a tag for my query, sort of a shorthand. All right. So I can put in CB for Cleveland Browns. All right. Then I click Save. So I have two text, two edit text fields. I click Save, and it goes down here. All right. I could go put something other in, something else in. Cleveland, let's be all sportsy today. Cavaliers. And I can type in CC and save it. And now I have it, and notice they're alphabetized. So it doesn't really matter the order I put them in, it alphabetizes them based on tags. If I click the edit button, next to it, it brings it back up there and I can change it. Oops. If I actually click the button with the tag on it, it actually runs out and does a Twitter search. Now, I'm not sure if I'm connected to the internet, so it might just sit there. In addition, they may have changed the Twitter API since the Dito book was written, so the search might not, not actually work. But do notice one thing. It fired up my browser. All right? Now, this gets to be with intents. All right? We'll, we'll talk about intents, not intents like, boy, I'm really intense today. Intents as, as the application intends to do something. So sometimes you can have multiple applications that can handle an intent. So for example, you could view, do a Twitter search, 
within your web browser. You can also do a Twitter search within the Twitter Android app. So if you have more than one app that can handle an intent, it will ask you, what do you want to do? Do you want to open it up with Twitter or do you want to open it up with um, uh, your web browser, Chrome? And then you can either pick it for this time I want to do this or you can say I always want to use this and you can save that as a preference. So that's a few things that are different from applications that we've seen so far. The one is the intent. The other is saving data. Another thing about this is notice that our GUI is, how do I want to say this? Um, our GUI is dynamic. In other words, with the tip calculator, there were six slots, all right? One for the tip, one for the total for each of three predefined rates. There were six of them. Here, I must, I must have the screen off after like 10 seconds. Here, the number of buttons up here are just how many I've saved. So if I've saved two, there's two buttons. If I save 36 searches, there'll be 36 buttons. We also have the ability to pick one and clear it, and it will erase it. All right? So, not an earth-shattering application, but it does do some different things other than what we've seen so far. So, let's take a few minutes to go through this app and look at the most important parts. All right, we have, first of all, the Android Manifest. Nothing earth shattering in this one. There's no mention of intents in this one because this application doesn't handle any intents. Okay? This will create an intent for something else to handle, but this will not handle intents. And we'll see examples later on where we can create an intent and have something else pop up. But the um, manifest is about the same that we had. Under values, oh, we have three different values. All right, three different value XML files. We have our strings file, which is about the same that we have all the time. All right. We also have a dimension file, and we have a colors file. Let's look at these. <laughs> if you're really old, the fifth dimension, singing the hits Aquarius and let the sun shine in. Ask your grandparents probably about that one. All right, this is a dimension file. And again, think of why we would want to do this. And again, the answer always is maintainability. All right? The second answer, which is closely related to this, is remember that we can create resource qualifiers for this. So in this dimension file, we can define here that the dimensions of our tag button width is 230 um, density independent pixels. And the edit button is 50 density independent pixels. Now we could make it, so if we were on a big screen, that it would be 500 density independent pixels if we had a big giant tablet as opposed to a tiny little phone. All right. We'll then reference these dimensions in our layout XML file. So our previous example, the XML file had hard-coded in there like 230 dp. Here we're pointing to this. And at some point, you might scratch your head and say, oh, that's getting to be a little bit of an overkill. Well, the flexibility that you get by doing things in a component manner comes at a cost. And the cost is it takes a little bit of extra time to set this up. It's not hard, just a little involved. Did, did, they, did they do it this way, you think, because 
when Android was originally developed, the phones weren't very fast because you just reuse it and reuse it and reuse it rather than writing it over and over and over again? Or is it just, I think it's part of that drive principle. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I, think, I think they developed this platform from the ground up uh -huh. and said, what can we do to make it more maintainable? What can we do to handle, to account for the fact that this is going to run on a million different devices? What can we do to handle the fact that this is going to be in a bunch of different countries, a bunch of different screen density? You know, what can we do to handle that? Along with just basic practices. Using that string XML file is beneficial even if you don't, even if you never internationalize your app because all your labels are in one place. Yeah. Now here's your colors. And colors again, same sort of idea. We're going to give a name of light orange to that color. <laughs> and then we can go in later on and call it light orange. <laughs> now, again, you know, if you are internationalizing this, different colors have different meanings in different cultures. All right, so it, it would be possible then, and again, I can't off the top of my head recite all these examples. I do know, for example, in some places, white is used for funerals as opposed to black. All right, maybe if any of you are aware of that or, or other cases, but again, Colors have meaning. So this would give you the ability to um, do that in a way that would be, um, you know, um, a little, uh, you, know, uh, you know, a little more specific to a given culture. Now, if we look at our layout file, notice we have two files. All right. We have our main XML file. And as I said, notice that, let me find an example here, ah, Android background of this table at color light orange. That not so much, now that I think about it, that's not so much for, um, for um, internationalization, although you could, you could, you could, instead of calling it orange, you could say highlighted and then use a different one for different or whatever. It's just a more user-friendly way to point to a color as opposed to hard coding in the hex code. Likewise, where would be one with the dimensions? Oh, I think we see that in the other XML file. Let's look at the other XML file. Not yet. We'll look at it in a minute. This is using a table layout, which we've seen before. Essentially two columns if I remember right, maybe three columns. Notice what this row consists of. This row doesn't have any table columns per se. It has a big scroll view. The scroll view is where we're going to put all those buttons. Why a scroll view for those buttons? So it'll get bigger and bigger and bigger, and if it goes off the end of the device, we can scroll to it. So we don't know how many buttons we're going to allow for, so we put a scroll view there. So what we're going to do is dynamically, through our code, we're going to add views to this view. All right. Remember, all these things that we've looked at, layouts and all that, many of these things are views. All right, scroll view being one of them. All right, we can go and we can add one view can contain other views. Right, so the whole screen is a view and we add views to it. And 
those views can contain views, and so on and so on. So this scroll view gives us a flexibility that we don't have to predefine that there's going to be five things, Twitter searches, that you can save. We can save as many of them as you want, and that will scroll. Now, what do you suppose this guy is? The new tag view. What do you suppose that represents? What, new, tag new tag view. I would think that that would represent every time you add a button. It, exactly. You the layout, so it exactly. The, and I'm going to put this at the end of this file so we can have both views in the same text edit document. document. The new tag I call that the new tag view? New tag layout? I thought you kept saying new tag view. No. The new new <laughs> tag view represents a table row that gets added to the scroll view. So that new tag layout contains the these two buttons and a checkbox. All right. It contains what get what gets added to the scroll view every time we add to this. So it contains how one of them looks. If we want three of them, we add that one thing three times. So this is a table row. All right. We're adding table rows to that scroll view. Why are we adding table rows? Because we're working in a table. So we're going to add table rows. Each table row consists of a button, another button, and a checkbox. But notice that just one of these is in the XML file. Every time we click Save to, sla to save a new Twitter search, we go grab this XML file, inflate it. Inflate means we bring it to life. And then we go and we add that new view, that new table row that we have inflated. We add that to the scroll view. Now notice here is where I was mistaken before. We use a dimension XML file here. We specify the width of this guy gets to be the dimension tag button width. And the edit button is the edit button width. So again, we pull that from the dimension file. All, right. All we have is the image-wise is icons. So, let's look at this. examine what is different, what is new about this, and let's kind of overview that, and then we'll look at each pieces of that functionality one at a time. We still have buttons, we still have listeners for buttons, we still have get element, or I'm sorry, get element by ID, I'm talking JavaScript now, find view by ID, alright. The difference is we have two XML layout files. One of them represents sort of the overall view of the app, of the activity, and one represents each new table row that we're adding in here. We are going to be using the share pre shared preferences because even if I, notice,
notice that there's one there, Cleveland Browns. Even if I go and turn this guy off, power off, and if I is it ideal to name that say Benson State or is that a predefined? It's predefined. Because I mean, you can name yeah. that whatever you want, right? After the bundle, because I know you you could. You could, but by default it comes out with that name, and so that would be helpful if, like, you were looking stuff up. It would probably use that name, like in any of the examples you'd see online. All right, so I'm powering this guy off, and I'm going to turn it back on to show you that the data in this application is persistent. All right, that is, it remembers our what we've entered in even when you power off. So it's not like just like the application doesn't shut down and we can re, like bring it back to life. If I go back in to this guy, that Twitter search is still there for the Cleveland Browns. So safe preferences is in the saved preferences first of all is different than the saved instance state all right shared preferences is a way of getting the data to be persistent um not just like from when the application gets deactivated and activated again but even when the application gets powered off so that's the one thing that's different the other thing that's different the second big thing that's different here pardon me yeah, is that we are dynamically creating our GUI. And we have a second XML file that we're going to bring to life every time they save one. The third thing that's different is we're going to have another intent. We're going to launch a Twitter search if they click on the tag. So what I want to focus on in this example, and again, I'll do this for the remainder of class today. Um, Monday, you know, barring another blizzard or whatever, we will continue with the other two things. But go over this example, and if there's anything else about the example you don't understand, bring it to my attention. I don't want to go through the code like line by line. That's boring for me, and it would have to be excruciating for you. All right? But I do want to point out like what is different between this app and the apps that we've seen before. What are the things that we want to learn? Um, again, the point of going over this, is a, this example isn't so you can write a Twitter search application. The point is these three new things that we haven't done before. Dynamic GUI, shared preferences, and firing off an intent. So the first thing I want to look at is I want to look at when we create a new row in that table. All right. So on create, we do all this stuff. We grab a pointer to the query table layout. And we grab a pointer to the button called Save Button. And we grab a pointer to those two text fields, the query edit text and the tag edit text. So we have pointers to this text, this text, this table, and this button. On the button, we set an on click listener, which is save button listener. Again, this is another example. Notice this guy doesn't implement the on click listener. We create our on click listener down here. Pardon me?
Oh, right here? Yeah. All right. Now, this listener is a little, has a little more code than the listener that we looked at before for the tip calculator. But still, the real work it's doing is in these method calls. Make tag. Oh, the make tag method. That's really where it's doing the work. All right. What else is in here? Well, we have a little bit of validation. We make sure that someone is that they've entered in something in the query field and in the tag field. If they have, then we're going to do this stuff. If they have have not, then we're going to pop up an alert dialog, and this shows you how to pop up an alert dialog that essentially tells them, hey, you forgot to enter something in. So in this application, if I go and click save without entering anything in there, I get an alert dialog that says, hey, you forgot to enter something in, rather than saving garbage. All right. So this does do some validation. So yes, there is more to this listener than the previous example, but it's really not doing a lot of work. It's simply doing the work of validating it, popping up an alert box. If everything's okay, then go in and save the tag. It's always good, and, and I, I, just got, um, I just got a Raspberry Pi in my office that I'm playing with. Oh, yeah? And, and, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, I'm, yeah I'm, I'm having, we're having some fun. We're going to think of trying to do some it, little projects for... No, it's they did just release another one. No, it's it's not a new new one. I had it like since November. Did you hear about the new one though? Run Windows, Windows? Yeah. yeah. I did see that. Yeah. yeah. I did see that, but I haven't gotten it. But I guess my point is is that if you noticed, I was playing with this mouse trying to get my screen to move when this is a mouse that's with the PC, not my laptop. So now I have well, now I have three mice on my desktop, uh, on my desk, physical desktop, not desktop, desktop. Um, so there's three times a chance I'm going to grab the wrong mouse um, when I'm working on something. At any rate, I almost did it again. What do I do if it does pass validation? Well, this is where the real work happens. I call the method called make tag, and I give it the value of the query and the value of the tag. I then blank out the two text edits, and I hide the keyboard. And this is a little nifty little thing to hide the keyboard. So really, the work of this that we're going to look at for the rest of today is in the make tag method, because the make tag method is what's going to go, and it is going to um, use that additional XML file to create a new row in that table. So, make tag, all right, first thing we do is we look to see if it's already been there, all right, if we've already added it. Why do we need to do this? We, yeah, we need to do this so there's no duplication, and we need to do this because the same methods get fired off whether we're saving something the first time or whether we're editing it. All right? So we look to see if it's already there. If it's already there, we go and we save in the save preferences the new values. All right? Save preferences part we'll focus on next time. If it's a brand new one, in other words, if we're not editing and saving an edited value, we're going to call refresh. 
refresh tag and add a new button for this. Is refresh tag. Here we go. What this does in a nutshell, I really want to get to the part where we talk about the XML file, so some of this I'll gloss over. We can go over it more next time. We essentially grab all the saved searches so that we can sort them. All right? Because remember, what we want to do is regardless of when they added the search, we want to make sure that the output's in alphabetical order. So we grab all the things that have been saved before and sort it. And then we go and we make the new row. All right, make tag GUI. So making tag GUI, here's the fun part. Here's the part that we wanted to talk about. We create a layout inflator. What is a layout inflator? A layout inflator takes a layout XML file and actually makes the real objects. It brings that layout XML file to life and puts it on the screen and actually creates the objects for the different views on it and so on. So, I need one of those to bring it to life. So I do that. I create a new tag view by calling my inflator and giving it the new tag view XML file. So, what does this do? This takes that new tag view XML file, right? Which one was that? That was this one that contains the single table row that contains two buttons and a checkbox. So, we create a new view by inflating, using our inflator object, to bring that XML file to life. So, when this statement finishes executing, we have stored in the variable new tag view, we have that new table row. All right? We have that new table row. And that table row contains a button, a button, and a checkbox. Now, Question, why do I not need to cast this as a table row? Because the XML is already calling it? No, not really. Is it not a table row object? It is a table row object. But a table row is also a view, all right? A table row is a kind of view. The reason that we don't need to cast it as a table row, where we do cast like the button is a button and the text, edit text field is an edit text field, is we don't need to do table row things with it. <laughs> we only need to treat it as a view, all right? That's all we need to do. We just need to treat it as a view. We don't have to do any of those methods that are specific to a table row. So we could have cast it as a table row, but we don't have to. All right? Because what are we going to do with that? We're going to go, and we're using the find view by ID, but notice the subtle difference. Now we have new tag view in front of find view by ID. In all the previous examples that we had, we simply said, find view by ID. What does that do? That looks within the activities content view for the thing that has this ID. This is looking for the thing within, I think I scrolled past it. Yeah. This is looking for the thing within that new view that I just created, that new table row, we're looking for the thing that is called new tag button. All right? Every one of these buttons has an ID of new table view. Well, how do we keep that straight? Well, we're adding them one at a time. And when we grab a pointer to it, 
We're not looking in the whole content view. We're just looking at that new row that we've inserted. So we find the tag view there. We set the text of that button to be the tag. And we set the on click listener to be query button listener. Now, in this case, every single button here uses the same on click listener. All right. Now, how does that work? Well, we'll see how that works. But do note that every one of these buttons, so if I have 100 Twitter queries or whatever, every one of them uses the same on-click listener for the edit and for the tag. So when you click on the tag and actually initiate the search, or when you click on the edit button and initiate the edit, in both cases, each one of those, there's, there's one listener for, for the search, there's one listener for the edit. So we have two listeners, not a bunch of listeners. And then, when we're done, we go in and we add to the query table layout. What is the query table layout? That's this midsection right here. We add that view to the new query or to the query table layout. So we add those buttons in on there. All right. So we sort of create this table row just sort of like out there in outer space. All right. We bring it to life. So we now got this table row floating out there. We find the buttons on there and set their listeners. We set the text to the search button. All right. We set the listeners to each of the two buttons. And when we're done, we take that table row that's floating in outer space and boom, put it in our table. All right, so it gets added to the GUI dynamically. So that's a formula we're going to see over and over again, all right, where we, when we're dynamically creating something in our GUI, we're going to have a layout for it. We're going to inflate it. We're going to point to different things in the new view that we created and manipulate those, set listeners, set properties, whatever we need to do. Then we're going to add that view to our main view or a certain portion of our main view. All right. That's where I'll leave this today. Next time we'll look at the rest of the app, like how does the li if it's the same listener handling each of those buttons, how does it know which search to do? If it's the same listener handling each edit button, how does it know which row to edit? We'll, look up, we'll, we'll find out those things, then we'll look at the shared preferences, and we'll look at the uh, initiation of an intent. Questions? I have a question that doesn't have to necessarily do with this. Okay. <clears throat> Okay. But I don't remember. Well, well, let me let me let me finish this. No, that's okay. Unless you don't want to be. I don't want to be on film. Don't want to be on film. You know. <laughs> okay. Let me let me let me shut.